Hello, I'm Justin Davis. I'm a Walpole Clinical Lecturer at Imperial College London. This is the second lecture in a series of three looking at the MRCP Part 2 Cardiology course. This second lecture is going to look at assessment and treatment of valvular disease and congenital abnormalities. So let's have a look at the diagnostic pathway to assess a degenerative valvular lesion. Well, the first and probably most important thing is to do an appropriate clinical assessment. So we'll now look at the diagnostic pathways necessary to assess a degenerative valvular lesion. In this example, we're going to look at aortic stenosis. So first off in our clinical assessment will be to look at the symptoms. And particularly in aortic stenosis, we're comparing symptomatic change between different consultations. So we'll be looking out to see if a patient had had episodes of syncope, whether there was progressive dyspnea or the onset of angina. And if we had any of those, there'd be particularly worrying features. After that, we'd want to go on to do non-invasive assessments, and this is most commonly done using an echocardiogram. On the slide here, you see two echocardiographic studies. On the left, you see a normal left ventricle. I'm just going to take a moment to point out the various features here. At the top, you see the right ventricle. You then see the septum, the left ventricular lumen, that's the big area here, and the posterior wall at the bottom. See in the middle you see the aortic valve which appears to be open nicely and below that you see the mitral valve. On the far side of the screen you see a patient who has aortic stenosis. You can really see that this is markedly different. The biggest difference is here as you can see some thickening of the left ventricular septum so this is left ventricular hypertrophy and you can also see that rather than the aortic valve opening nicely as it did in the first case the leaflets appear calcified and restricted. So this is classic for a patient with aortic stenosis. So after we've done the 2D echocardiography, we can then do Doppler studies through the aortic valve to assess the velocity of the jet. We know that a patient has an unobstructed aortic valve. The velocity through uh, the valve is low, typically around about 90 centimetres a second, whereas if someone has severe aortic stenosis, the velocity through the valve is much quicker, somewhere in the order of 3 or 4 metres per second for someone who has severe aortic stenosis. You can see this on these two slides here. On the left hand side here you see someone with normal aortic valve where the velocities are low and on the right hand side of your screen we see someone with severe aortic stenosis where the velocities are far higher. So once we've completed this non-invasive part of the assessment we then move on to invasive studies which are usually based in the cardiac catheter lab. These are principally focused in determining whether the coronary arteries are normal and patent. This is particularly important before an operation. And also to assess the pressure changes. Here on your screen you see the different tools or different catheters we use to measure pressures. On the left hand side you see a pigtail catheter, so called because it has a curly tail. This is very important as it prevents damage to the ventricle. And on the far side of your slide here you see a pulmonary capillary wedge catheter. Now this is a catheter which is positioned by running this up through the femoral vein, into the right atrium, down through the tricuspid valve, up through the right ventricle, through the pulmonary artery, and pushing the catheter distally where a little balloon is inflated. We measure pressure beyond the balloon, and of course by inflating the balloon, we take out the pressures originating from the pulmonary artery, and we're looking at a simple column of blood which extends all the way from the end of the balloon to the left atrium. So this wedge pressure gives us a surrogate measure of what's actually happening in the left atrium. So it's a very, very important measure. It gives us an insight into left atrial physiology. So these are some of the traces we actually get. Here you see on the left-hand side some left ventricular pressure waveforms. You can see there are four or five beats of left ventricular pressure. And then you see a big jagged rise in the curve. This is when the catheter is pulled back through, from the left ventricle through the aortic valve into the aorta. And then after that you can see what resembles a more routine or more normal looking aortic pressure waveform. Now we're often asked to calculate a pressure gradient or a pullback gradient in the aorta. And this is simply calculated by measuring the difference in pressure between that in the left ventricle and in the aorta. And in this case, you can see there's no pressure drop and the gradient would be zero. So what about the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure waveforms? 
Well, on the left hand side of the screen here you can see a typical pulmonary capillary pressure waveform. Now remember, this is measured by pushing a catheter through the pulmonary artery to the distal pulmonary vessel where a balloon is blown up and a pressure measurement made. This gives us a surrogate measure of the left atrial pressure. You'll then see there seems to be a jagged rise in the trace and after that what appears to be a more normal pressure waveform. This is our pulmonary artery pressure waveform and this is measured simply by deflating the balloon and pulling the catheter back very slightly. Both of these pressure traces, both the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and the pulmonary artery trace, are elevated and this would imply there's some pathology going on probably on the left side of the heart. So let's have a look at question one. A 27-year-old lady who has recently arrived to the UK from India is referred to the cardiology department because of intermittent palpitations associated with dizziness. She describes the palpitations as fast and irregular with sudden onset and termination. She remembers a prolonged illness as a child but is unsure as to the nature of this. On examination, she appears comfortable but underweight. Her pulse is 80 beats a minute, regular. The jugular venous pressure is not raised and there is no peripheral edema. There is a rumbling diastolic murmur over the apex and an aus auscultation of the heart and the chest is clear. An echocardiogram performed confirms the presence of rheumatic mitral stenosis. The patient is referred for a cardiothoracic opinion. Two weeks later, she attends the emergency department, feeling extremely unwell. On examination, she is found to be in fast atrial fibrillation with a rate of 130 beats a minute. Her blood pressure is 90 over 60 millimetres of mercury and her oxygen saturations have fallen to 92% on air. She is placed in the resuscitation area for closer monitoring. Which one of the following would be the best pharmacological intervention? I'll just give you a moment to consider your options here. If you went for answer D, intravenous esmolol, you are correct. Mitral stenosis puts the heart at profound physiological compromise. The main problem is a lack of good filling to the left ventricle. So whereas it's easy to think about left ventricular cardiac output as being purely driven by how hard the heart pumps, the heart can only eject as much blood as moves into it during diastole. Now, if you have mitral stenosis, of course, the amount of blood which moves from the left atrium to the left ventricle is restricted. This means the cardiac output falls and the patient becomes more symptomatic, often associated with a rise in the pulmonary pressures. If a patient then goes into atrial fibrillation, this makes the situation much worse. For a start, they lose the atrial kick, so they lose the atrial contraction, which can help to drive blood through the stenotic mitral valve. And also, on top of that, the rate increases dramatically. With an increasing heart rate, the diastolic period falls, meaning that the left ventricle is less well filled and the cardiac output falls. On top of this cardiac ejection problems, of course, the other thing with increasing the heart rate and shortening the diastolic period is there's less time for the coronary arteries to be perfused with blood. So you have a situation whereby the cardiac output falls, meaning the systemic pressures fall, and also the coronary perfusion falls, leading to ischemic myocardium. We'll now consider the second part to this question. As part of her workup, she undergoes a left and right heart catheter study. Which of the following results are consistent with a diagnosis of severe mitral stenosis with no additional pathology? I'll give you a moment to consider your options. If you went for answer B, peak pulmonary capillary wedge pressure of 45 millimetres of mercury, you're absolutely correct. So we're now going to look at the normal chamber pressures and saturations in the healthy cardiovascular system, which of course is important prior to looking at the disease state. So in the right atrium, we'd expect a pressure of 5 millimetres of mercury. The right ventricle, approximately 5 times higher at 25 millimetres of mercury, which is the same as in the pulmonary trunk. In the left atrium, pressures are higher, around about 10 millimetres of mercury, the left ventricle higher than that of the right ventricle, around 120 millimetres of mercury, which are the same as in the aorta. So what about saturations? Well, in the inferior vena cava, the saturation is around 76%. In the right atrium, around about 75%. And in the superior vena cava, 
Now, one wouldn't expect, unless there was a hole between the right and left atrium, there'd be any difference in saturations between the right atrium and the right ventricle. So a normal right ventricular saturation would be around about 75%, which is the same as that in the pulmonary artery. Of course, once blood has been through the lungs and oxygenated, these saturations rise markedly. So the left atrium saturations would be around about 98%, which is the same as in the left ventricle and in the aorta. So let's have a look at question three. A 62-year-old male smoker presents with chest pain. He undergoes a coronary angiogram and a right and left heart catheter study. The following is his pressure study results and his coronary angiogram. I'll give you a moment to consider these. So which of the following diagnoses best fits the clinical history and the results of these investigations? If you answered A, aortic stenosis, you'd be correct. Before we review the pressure trace numbers and the saturations, just take a moment to look at the coronary angiogram. Here you can see the catheter is inserted in the left main stem and dye is injected and it travels all down the left coronary system. You can see that the arteries are smooth and regular and there doesn't appear to be any narrowing or stenosis. This is typical of what we report as being unobstructed or normal coronary arteries. Let's have a look at the uh, pressure traces and the saturation numbers. Here we can see if we look down the list of pressure traces, bearing in mind the normal values we discussed a moment or two ago, that everything appears to be very normal until we get down to the left ventricular pressure and the aortic pressure. The left ventricular pressure, which typically is around 120 millimeters of mercury, appears to be elevated here, so from 120 up to 190. But there appears to be a drop in pressure between the left ventricle and the aorta. Here, of course, this is a big clue that there must be a stenosis there between the left ventricle and the aorta, causing the pressure to drop. This stenosis, of course, is consistent with the diagnosis of aortic stenosis, which, of course, is the right stem in this question. So let's have a look at question four. A 13-year-old child is found not to be thriving. Routine biochemistry demonstrates an elevated plasma calcium. A murmur is detected, and after routine investigations, he is put forward for a left and right heart catheter study. Here are the results of the pressure and saturations recorded during that study. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Have a look at these stems and see which one you think is most likely. If you answered A, Williams syndrome, you were correct. Williams syndrome is characterized by E-line faces, learning difficulties due to micro deletion on chromosome seven. If we look at the pressure traces here, you can see that there's a clear abnormality between the pressure in the ascending aorta and the descending aorta. Pressure in the ascending aorta is 153 millimeters of mercury, whereas that in the descending aorta is 88 millimeters of mercury. The pressure in the ascending aorta is essentially the same as that in the left ventricle, suggesting that the obstruction is beyond the ascending aorta and not at a valvular level. So here we can see this appears to be a case of supra-aortic outflow obstruction rather than aortic stenosis per se. And this in conjunction with the raised calcium and the phenotypic picture we get from the question's history confirms a diagnosis of Williams syndrome. So let's have a look at question five. An 18-month-old baby presents with dyspnea and cyanotic spells. A systolic murmur is detected and after initial investigations a right and left heart catheter study is performed. I'll give you a moment to consider the results of this study. So let's have a look at the stems for this study. I'd like you to consider which of these is the most likely diagnosis. If you answered A, tetralogy of fallows, you were correct. Let's have a look at these pressure and saturation numbers to try and see if we could come to this conclusion from these. So looking down the list, let's look and see what's most abnormal here. 
Well, we know that the right atrial pressure is about correct at 8 millimetres of mercury with a normal value of around about 5 millimetres of mercury. But clearly there's a huge step up between the right atrium and the right ventricle. And the right ventricular pressure of 90 millimetres of mercury is hugely elevated over the 25 millimetres of mercury, which is normal. Now interestingly, as we go from the right ventricle to pulmonary artery, the pressure drops. And it drops to a more normal pulmonary value of around about 25 millimetres of mercury. Now in addition to these abnormal pressure values, we also see that there appears to be a step up in saturations between the right atrium and the right ventricle. This implies that blood is moving from a higher saturation level from perhaps the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart. And indeed, this is in exactly what is happening. This patient has tetralogy of fallows. The reason the right ventricular pressure is high is they have a large VSD. The VSD allows blood to move from the left side of the heart to the right side of the heart, and it fills the right side of the heart with more blood and in which it increases the pressure. As the pressure is higher, this causes the right ventricle to stretch and as a result to become less good a pump. In patients with fallows, one of the other characteristic features is pulmonary stenosis. And this explains why the pressure can be very high in the right ventricle but yet be totally normal within the pulmonary arteries. So the pulmonary stenosis is actually protecting the pulmonary arteries from high pressures and, and protecting them from developing pulmonary hypertension. So by looking at these numbers, it's possible to distinguish between a VSD on its own and a VSD caused by fallows. What do we mean by that? Well, if we had a VSD on its own, one would expect the pressure in the right ventricle to be high and the pressures in the pulmonary artery to be high, i.e. there's no pulmonary stenosis, there's no protection of the pulmonary architecture. In this case, of course, we have high pressure in the right ventricle, but because there's pulmonary stenosis associated with the fallows, the pulmonary arteries are protected and pressures are normal there. So these pressure traces are very, very helpful in coming to a diagnosis and can probably are likely to confirm the findings from an echocardiographic study or an MRI study, which may well have been performed as well. Question six. A seven-year-old male presents with increasing shortness of breath during school games. His right heart appears slightly dilated on echocardiography and a left and right heart pressure study is requested. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? I'll give you a moment to consider these options. If you went for A, atrial septal defect, you were correct. The second part of this question addresses which one of the following is the size of this shunt. I'd give you a moment to consider the options here again. If you went for B, a shunt ratio of 1.6 to 1, you were correct. And the third stem of this question asks, which of the following treatments would you recommend? I'll give you a moment to consider these stems. If you went for A, closure, you were correct. So let's take a moment to see if we can use the pressure and saturation studies performed in the catheter lab to help confirm our diagnosis. If we look at the right atrium, pressures appear very normal, around 4 millimetres of mercury. However, the saturations are elevated. We would expect a saturation of around 74%, but here you can see the saturation is elevated to 85%. This implies that there's an abnormal communication between the saturated blood on the left side of the heart and that in the right side of the heart very early on in this, uh, the chain of events in blood flow through the right heart. We can see another abnormality as we go into the right ventricle. Pressure here is higher than one normally would expect it. So rather than being 25 millimetres of mercury, it's 36 millimetres of mercury. One can, however, note that the saturations remain relatively constant in the right ventricle, around about 86%. As we move forward, the pulmonary artery pressures and saturations remain relatively constant to those in the right ventricle. This suggests that there are no further communications between the left and the right heart. The left-sided pressure and saturations 
all look within normal range of what we'd expect. So it appears that there's an abnormal communication between the left and right atrium, which is allowing more blood to move from the saturated left heart to the right heart under higher pressure. And this is causing the right pre ventricular pressure to increase and causing the increase in saturations that we see. So let's look at how we calculate a shunt. This is often an area which confuses candidates hugely. A shunt is essentially an abnormal displacement of blood from one chamber to another. In this diagram here, you can see I've drawn a schematic of the right heart and the left heart, separated by the septum. At the top would be the intraatrial septum and the intraventricular septum at the bottom of the screen. Normally, of course, blood can't move between the two sides of the heart, and blood moves from the right atrium to the right ventricle and into the lungs, back from the lungs to the left atrium, left ventricle, and out to the body. If, however, there's an abnormal communication, as you see here, blood can move from either side of the heart. The passage of movement depends on the pressures on either side of the heart. So, in normal situations, if the left atrial pressure is higher than that in the right, blood will move from the left atrium to the right atrium, exactly as what's happening in this question. So how do we actually calculate a quantifiable number for the amount of blood moving from the left heart to the right heart to give us the 1.61 ratio which we found in this question? Well, there's a very simple formula. This is all based around the saturations that we recorded in the catheter lab. Firstly, we take the aortic saturations. We minus the mixed venous saturations and we divide that by 98 minus the pulmonary artery saturations. So let's have a look at what happened in the abnormal situation, such as in this question. All we do is we take the numbers we recorded in the catalogue and plug them into this equation. So the saturation in the aorta here was 97. That in the mixed venous sample was 74. We still have our constant 98, and the pulmonary artery saturations were 84. When we do this simple algebra in this uh, equation, we get a value of 1.6, which gives us a shunt range ratio of 1.6 to 1. So here we can see, by knowing the saturations in the different chambers of the heart, it's possible to calculate a shunt ratio, which gives us a quantifiable measure of the amount of blood which is moving from one side of the heart to the other in this patient with an atrial septal defect. So we're now going to have a look at some of the ways we can assess a coronary stenosis. Now you may wonder why some of these techniques have been developed as techniques in the catheter lab now are so good. It's very, very easy to, to deploy stents to treat narrowed arteries. However, there's a problem with deploying stents in so much as if we deploy a stent, it carries a risk, both acutely, of course, while the procedure is happening, but also there's a the risk of early thrombosis at around about 2% and a re-stenosis risk, so this is re-narrowing of the vessel within the stent itself of between 5 and 35%. And this leads us to question whether we actually should be deploying stents in all but the most critical of lesions. On the screen here you see a coronary angiogram, and at the top you see a coronary stenosis. Now sometimes lesions appear very, very tight, and it's very, very easy to know that we just have to put a stent in. But at other times, it's very difficult. And there may be something which looks very, very indeterminate. And it's hard, purely by eye, to say whether we should deploy a stent or not. Now, one of the reasons for this is, of course, the physics of fluoroscopy. We're essentially taking a three-dimensional structure of the heart, and we look at it in two planes. And here you can see the problem on the slide. At the top, you see we're cutting the coronary angiogram slide in two planes. If we cut it down one plane, it looks like the artery only has a 20% stenosis. If we cut it down the other plane, it looks like it has an 80% stenosis. So which of these is correct? Of course, it's sometimes very, very difficult to say by using pure fluoroscopy on its own, which has led to the development of other tools. So what other tools are there? Well, there's intravascular ultrasounds. You may have heard of that as IVUS. And there's tools such as fra fractional flow reserve, or FFR. Let's have a look at both of these briefly. The first of these modalities is intravascular ultrasound, or IVUS. You can see on your screen here there's two IVUS images. On the left is a normal IVUS image, and on the far side of your screen is an IVUS image of a patient with a diseased or stenosed coronary artery. IVUS is a way of 
using intravascular ultrasound beams within the artery itself to generate a map of the artery which distinguishes between the lumen, where blood flows down, and the layers which make up the artery wall. On the left image you can see that the lumen is big, allowing lots of blood to flow down the artery. However, on the right side, you can see that there's marked stenosis with the actual lumen area in the middle, the black area, is far smaller. Now the beauty of IOC, it allows us to see in the artery in three dimensions as we push the catheter back and forwards, and also allows us to quantify the exact size of the artery and the stenosis, so we can get a real, really good feel for the severity of the narrowing, and it also can aid us with choosing what size stent to use. So the second technique is uh, fractional flow reserve or FFR. This involves us measuring the difference in pressure between that in the proximal coronary artery taken from the catheter and that from a tiny little pressure sensor wire which is positioned beyond the stenosis. On this image here, the first two or three beats, you can see the pressures are equal as the wire is positioned in the proximal artery. You can see these, the blue and red traces. As we move beyond the stenosis, you can see how the pressure readily falls, and the blue one goes well below that of the red proximal uh, coronary pressure. Now, in assessing fractional flow reserve, we don't assess these pressure drops at rest, but we assess them after the administration of adenosine. Adenosine is a va vasodilator which potently opens up the, the small vessels which run through the coronary microvasculature. Here you can see the effects of opening up the vasculature and you can see in the green trace how this distal pressure or the pressure beyond the stenosis falls readily. By comparing a ratio of the mean pressures proximal to the stenosis and distal to the stenosis we get a number. Here with a ratio of 0.69 which tells us from the huge wealth of trial data that this lesion is very significant and a need of a coronary stent. So that concludes the second of our three MRCP Part 2 cardiology lectures. I hope you've enjoyed this second lecture and advise you to go over the questions once again to familiarise yourself with the subject material and the questions we've been through. Mm -hmm.